Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio. I'm James Spencer. I'm Steve Wilkes. This is our annual disaster show. The annual what WTF did I do? <laughs> what the firkin did I do yeah, this that's time? That's right. <laughs> so this is, a, if, if you are a beginning home brewer, this is not the first podcast that you want to listen to in this show because uh, this is... This is this is a show about the things that can go wrong, uh, and you should probably listen to all the other shows first, and then listen to this show uh, to get tips. Because if you listen to this show, you might get discouraged. You might think that you're going to destroy no. your house every time oh. you brew or no. alienate your significant other, and uh, that's that's usually not the case. Usually not. I'm on my fourth wife <laughs> <laughs> this week. This week. <laughs> so uh, uh, Steve and I. Uh, every year we get together and we solicit homebrewers to send in uh, their uh, homebrewing disaster stories from the previous year. And uh, we get together with the uh, brew hauler people, yes. the manufacturers of these wonderful uh, things that you strap on your carboy and they they put handles on your carboy so that you don't drop them. That's right. I have several because they are – I think they're, they're – uh, Required equipment. They're very handy. If you have glass carboys. Indeed. Uh, even, I guess, if you had, uh, you know, a plastic carboy, you might yeah. need these as well. But, yeah. uh, they, but you know, when glass carboys get wet and you're cleaning them, they get slippery and uh, you can drop them as people might have done. I'm not going to spoil anything. Don't give it away. But um, anyway, you need a brew hauler. Uh, if you don't know what they are, uh, Google them. And uh, go find them at, the, at your local homebrew store or online. And uh, the Brew Hauler people uh, have uh, sponsored this year's show again. Uh, they have contributed 10 brew haulers uh, to, to uh, give out as prizes. So we will uh, we'll select our favorite 10 and give them brew haulers. Uh, and then uh, I will contribute uh, uh, 10... Brewer's Logbook, or not 10, five Brewer's Logbooks <laughs> and five uh, uh, special bottle openers, our basic brewing bottle openers as prizes as well. So th- so that will make t- oh, five. Five bottle openers, five Brewer's Logbooks, ten uh, brew haulers. Other than that, what have the Romans done for us? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, there's the, the roads. roads. There's the roads. <laughs> And and uh, you know they brought peace, but other than that, <laughs> other and than the that. sewage. Oh, yeah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so we should say that Steve and I, uh, as I think is the holiday tradition now, we have just recorded uh, our video, uh, hol- our video year end extra mm-hmm. that we will put on the app, the Basic Brewing app, and we will also uh, email it out to people who have contributed into the Basic Brewing tip jar. So if you go to basicbrewing.com slash support and contribute to the tip jar, uh, you'll get an email with a link to this year's uh, special extra that we're not – I'm not, I'm not going to put it on YouTube. It's only, I'm not going to put it uh, out there on the general podcast feed. It's only for those f- for, with the app and those who have uh, contributed to the tip jar. And I think that's only fair. Yeah. That we give above and beyond to the people who have given above and beyond. And what, what did we do this year? Bah, 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 what? <laughs> what did we do this year? <laughs> it's been so long ago. What, um, did, what did we make this year ah, for, the, uh, yes. for the thing? We made cabbage rolls. Cabbage rolls with Cajun boudin sausages. So it's like a pork and rice sausage and actually leftover turducken that we had for my <laughs> my birthday dinner. But it's like, what do you do with leftovers? Well, you make you make sausage. And and so we kind of made a, a new sausage out of all that. And you just got to get the uh, episode and watch it. That's right. We did it. We did. We used some of my homemade sauerkraut, which we, you've seen uh, on the video podcast, how to make that. And we used some of my uh, gooseberry Saison, let's call it, mm-hmm. uh, that you're going to see in a future episode of Basic Growing Video uh, in the recipe as well. Uh, and we drank a coffee stout from Mother's uh, Brewing Company up in Springfield, Missouri. So uh, we had a lot of fun. Uh, there was a big old blooper in the middle of it that I kept in because it was just too darn funny. <laughs> <laughs> so stay tuned for that. Yeah. So anyway, that's enough. Uh, we have a beer. We uh, uh, Our friend uh, Lester from uh I believe it's Nutley, New Jersey, sent us a care package of a lot of good stuff. Mm. 
And par part of it was two home brews. Uh, he sent some commercial beers as well from Flying Fish Brewery uh, and Captain Lawrence. He sent a like, Captain Lawrence Kolsch uh, and some some other beers that uh, the, some of the like the Flying Fish IPA doesn't. It's gone. I'm sorry, Steve. I, <laughs> I couldn't help myself. These things happen. So anyway, Lester in New Jersey uh, sent us uh, this wonderful care package just to say thank you for the podcast, which is awesome. Uh, and um, one of the beers is a 100% Brett Saison, which was, it says, best of show hmm. in a competition. So why don't you pour? I'll do that. While I start reading, there are a ton of letters. A so, ton? So prepare yourself. This may be a long one. So she said, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it just it was all I could do not to say that, and then I had to say it. Well, I was anticipating you are saying that. So now, the, this is the 100% Brett beer. I, that's all we know is, is that's what it is. Cheers. Cheers. Mm. Mm. Wow. That's really good. That is that is gooder than pie. <laughs> that's very good. It's really good. It's not as funky as you would anticipate. No. And we've anticipated, we have encountered this with other 100% Brett beers. Uh, you would think that, you know, a beer with a little bit of Brett mm. added is pretty funky. The 100% Brett beers typically aren't as funky as you would think. It's got a little bit of Brett funk. Yeah. There's but a... uh, it's uh, kind of citrusy. Yeah. And um, Yeah. It's, it's mm. like lemon. It's very effervescent. It's very clean, mm -hmm. meaning it cleans the palate. Right. Fairly but dry. Fairly dry. You do get a little of that barnyard, little little wet just sock a, just, thing going on there. Just a little bit. But it's, but it's in a good way. That is delicious. Mm. So thanks, Lester. And I'll there's another down. beer that we'll wow. later on we'll get to. Mm. And um, I'm going to start with this with this uh, this letter from Lisa. Uh, she says, uh, "My husband and this this is a disaster in a way that you, will be unexpected." She says, "My husband Kevin is a dedicated fan of your podcast and one of your, and of your very helpful suggestions." Well, that's awesome. I wasn't really into this hobby until we both brewed a homemade pumpkin ale together last year. It was our 30th wedding anniversary, and after drinking a fantastic pumpkin ale, I decided it would be fun to create our own recipe. While I'm not into it as he is, it is still so much fun to see him get excited over making a new batch or create a recipe I would love. Well, that's, that's yeah. what it's all about. It's very touching. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin has been home brewing for 20 years. This September wow. marked his 20th. I'm so proud of him and his accomplishments, having won Best of Show at our state fair in New Jersey years back. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe in large part his confidence is gaining uh, due to the show that you and Steve have created. Well, that's very well, nice of her to say nice. that. Recently on a long trip, he replayed one of the podcasts, forced her to listen to it, in other words. <laughs> and, and I must confess, I really enjoyed it as I love to cook. So now I get it. As to the fascination with my husband's love of beer and brewing, he is fascinated uh, with the chemistry. And she says, uh, I was hoping you could give my hubby and my best friend, Kevin, a shout out on November 19th, as it is our 31st anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> so now you see the disaster. <laughs> I, she sent me this wonderful uh, email, and uh, then I put it in the wrong folder. I put it in the disaster folder. So here it is. A belated happy anniversary, uh, Lisa and Kevin. Uh, so there you go. I, I apologize. That's the disaster. The disaster is I was a, I was clumsy and stupid and put the e the kind email in the wrong folder. And I'm sure she's hating. She was hating me up until this point because I didn't, <laughs> I, as promised. I I said that I would read the email, and I I misplaced it. So anyway, and I do want to make it a practice. I don't want to mention everybody's birthday or anniversary. I don't. You know, no. I'm not Willard Scott for crying out loud. But anyway. You could be. I could be, if I keep drinking and eating the way I do. All right. Okay, here we go. Into the disasters. And some of these are sent, uh, you know, earlier in the year because people have a disaster, and while it's fresh on their minds, they send it in. That's right. So this is from Luke in Syracuse, New York. Uh, it says, uh, "'Twas the night before brew day. I assembled a list of what was needed and checked it twice. A mash tun." Hot liquor tank, boil kettle, mash spoon, burner, water, refractometer, hops are in the fridge, milled grain from the store. They didn't look very milled. And a, and a keg to transport wort. After being happy and sure that I had everything ready to go, I packed it next 
to the door so that I would not forget any more. As the night rest assured that I was ready, I, was, I fell asleep. I woke the next day excited to brew with a friend for the very first time. This has never happened, so there was a skip to my step. I loaded the car. I even packed my wife, <laughs> and we brought our little kid. We took off to our friend's house, and we arrived. We came to a skid. This is a, an untraditional rhyming scheme here. It is. I unloaded the car, excited to brew, and I ran through the list and realized I left the hops in the fridge. <laughs> <laughs> Our wives came to the rescue and said, We'll go to the store to buy the hops you need, and we'll be off and back in a dash. With a sigh of relief, we got going on our first partial mash. After we finished, we started on the all-grain and followed the step to, to make a nice brew. My first pale ale will be very nice. We will be able to enjoy this session as we can have it more than twice. Because the day was cold, I thought, Let's do a decoction mash to keep our temperatures right. I added enough water to be able to do a full boil. As I checked the gravity with four gallons in the pot, I said, Oh, no, I've already overshot. I was over my original gravity and still had to boil. I had three gallons when we finished and said, This isn't nice. This is naughty at best. What a disaster I have uh, of what I should. Someday I'll have to get this process mastered. As I look back, I remember that, that the, I remembered that the grains looked like they were not the grains looked like they were not crushed or cracked very well. I asked Santa for a grain masher. Next time I brew, I will be the one to do all the grain mashing. So there you go. Well, that's a right jolly, right jolly old problem. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, let's skip across the uh, the Atlantic to Norway. This oh. is uh, from Oyvind. Yeah. In Sandefjord, Norway. What is a Norway? <laughs> Five or six pounds. That's right. <laughs> it's like a Hinway. <laughs> Oyvind says, this year for our annual Christmas beer experiment, we decided to do a Bach recipe with Pilsen-style hops and ale yeast. Kind of a greatest hits of all the things we like, all in one short time frame. Hence the ale yeast. Hmm. Being on the cutting edge of new findings, as it were, we decided to throw in a triple decoction mash just for fun. Well, and, and those are fun. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Everything seemed to work out very nicely on the brew day, but when it came down to bottle, we tasted the hydrometer sample and were immediately struck by an astringent bitter taste, more likely associated with spiced herbal schnapps. My first mm. reaction was that I'd mistakenly used a dirty shot glass that had remains of Fernet Branca in it. I used to love her movies. <laughs> <laughs> But several sips later, it dawned on us that the batch might be ruined by a sloppy decoction mash. Oh, no. Ooh. Uh, know what? Nobody likes sloppy second runnings. No. With six gallons of this. <laughs> Can't go halvesies on those. <laughs> With six gallons of this stuff ripe for bottling, we decided we would spend the bottle caps anyway in the hope that the taste would mellow out over time. Now, two months later, the beer is still positively undrinkable. Hmm. But it makes for a fun practical joke from time to time, although I suspect it doesn't do the reputation of homebrewers any favors. <laughs> Here, drink this. I made it. Oy! <laughs> we call the beer uh, Yari's Jägerbomb. Mm -hmm. I would send you a sample, but we use twist-off bottles, which would probably just make for an even bigger practical joke upon delivery. So I'll spare you and me the trouble. Oh, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, if I had to pick a cause for the unwanted flavors, I would say the decocting mash portions were too thin, and getting them up to boiling temperature took too long, which brought out a fair amount of tannins from the grains. Ah, uh, yeah. Despite this mishap, I think there is a good brew in there somewhere, and I'd like to try it again with a simpler mash. Well, that there you go. I think that's that's a a, a fine uh, diagnosis of uh, of the issue. Eric from how would you pronounce that? Chat. Just a minute. Chapachet, Rhode Island. Chapachet, Rhode Chepachet? Island. Chapachet, Rhode Island. <laughs> didn't, didn't he carve wooden dolls? <laughs> <laughs> I need new glasses. <laughs> My, instead of instead of Google Glass, I've got uh, Mister Magoo Google Glass. <laughs> Roadhog. Roadhog. <laughs> hey, Charlie. Hi, ah, Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> Eric says, I recently had one of those brew days where everything. That could go wrong, did. I thought I'd share my pain for the next time you do a brewing disaster show. See, you sent this in March. Yeah. So there you go. This particular brew day was for an idea that I've been kinking around for a long time. It's a two-mash barley wine where the wort from the initial mash is used as the brewing liquor for a second mash. 
This allows for you to brew a very big beer with your existing mash tun and kettle without the need for an extended boil. I think that's a re reiterated mash. Mm -hmm. I brewed two lower gravity beers prior to this barley wine to grow up to a sizable pitch of yeast, and I only had one window of opportunity in the whole month to brew this beer and make use of this large, healthy pitch of yeast. This was a big and therefore expensive beer, of course, mm -hmm. that required a rather involved process. So I planned everything out as well as I could to ensure that my brew day would run as smoothly as possible. Foreshadowing. <laughs> uh, Eric says, uh, apparently the brewing gods mistook my preparedness for conceit and sought to punish me as many ways as they could. Number one, <laughs> my all-grain procedure is a two-vessel brew in a bag where I mash in a beverage cooler lined with a brew in a bag bag to help hold my mash temperature. Since this beer calls for two mashes, I needed to hunt down my spare grain bag that I hadn't used in several months. My nose found it first. Apparently it wasn't as dry as I thought when I packed it away. Mm. I was hit by the distinct heady aroma of compost when I pulled it out. Thankfully, a long soap in hot soapy water, or a long soak in hot soapy water, followed by an overnight soak in PBW, was able to erase the smell. If I only knew this was merely a harbinger of things to come. Number two. Since I knew that I had a long involved brew day ahead of me, I set my alarm to half past way too early o'clock so I could start heating my strike water. Shortly thereafter, my wife, and the best stories involve the wife. I think, Always. Uh, who was on her way to work, <clears throat> came running into the house. The battery in her car died. Since she was already running late, I didn't have time to jump her car and had to drive her to work, 45 minutes away, which means I lost three hours. Um, okay, number three. Okay, back home, time to mill my grain. My recipe calls for eight pounds of grain in each mash. My grain mill has a seven-pound hopper. Guess where the extra pound wound up? <laughs> if you guessed the floor, you would be correct. <laughs> yep. About two pounds into the milling, my first batch of grains, my mill jammed. I had nowhere to put the grains that were in the hopper. Thankfully, after many profanities, which helps, I feel, mm -hmm. I tried spinning the roller back and forth a few times and was able to clear the jam without making a bigger mess on the floor. Number five. Next step, transferring my strike water from my kettle to the cooler. Normally, I, I use an auto siphon to transfer the bulk of the water so I don't have to pick up my kettle and dump four plus gallons of hot water into the cooler. Although I realize that the auto siphon is not intended for hot water, I've never had an issue at my normal strike temps. But, <laughs> <laughs> foreshadowing. Yeah. But this time my strike water was considerably hotter since I was targeting a, a high initial mash temp using a lot more grain than usual. I started my siphon, and when I returned a couple of minutes later, the hot water had softened it to the point that it had bent into the shape of an L against the side of my kettle. Mm. Guess I won't be using that siphon again. Number six. Once my mashes were done, it was time to get my hop additions ready. I have about 20 pounds of hops in my freezer. Despite this, I somehow didn't have a single ounce of magnum, which I needed for my bittering addition. Thankfully, I was able to find an acceptable substitute among the 50 pounds or so that were strewn about my garage floor. Good and number seven. As my wort was chilling down, I took my final refractometer sample for my original gravity, but the gravity was so high it was completely off the scale to the point where I didn't see any blue at it all in my sight window. Good Lord, I've been that high. <laughs> but it's been <laughs> not, years. Not since the 70s. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, the gravity was within in the range of my hydrometer. My original gravity was 1.142, which was right in the ballpark that I was hoping for. Wow, that ballpark has a big green monster in it. No apparently. kidding. Uh, fortunately, none of my mishaps ended up derailing my brew day. My wort is fermenting happily, and I was able to fix my wife's car while all of this was going on. It will probably be a while before this bill is re beer is ready and in its prime, but I won't be forgetting this brew day anytime soon. Yeah, there's always a wife. You get extra points for or extra extra points for the mention of the uh, the wife. Um, uh, Steve sipping his beer is not fair. Yeah. Mm. Pete. Pete from Auckland, New Zealand. Ah. He wrote in April. I realize this is a way off, <laughs> but unfortunately, here's a story for an annual brewing disaster show. <laughs> Ironically, I had only just listened, finished listening to your most recent brewing disasters podcast and was feeling pretty smug about not having experienced a major brewing disaster in the two years I've been brewing. It turns out I celebrated a little too soon, like Icarus. Yep. He flew a little too high. That's right. To the uh, propane heater. 
I had the opportunity to complete a reasonably quick brew day and was excited at having finally got my hands on some Amarillo, as it is rare as hen's teeth here in New Zealand. Boy, if you can get pelletized hen's teeth, oh, it's man. really, you know, it's good for a, uh, a clarifier. Yep. I decided to beef up your 15-minute APA to a 30-minute APA with extra hops. <clears throat> the brew day went perfectly. With all the numbers being hit and the hop additions were smelling awesome. I chilled my wort, but due to the temperature here at the moment, couldn't get my wort below 25 degrees Celsius or 77, uh, 77 Fahrenheit. So I decided to put my fermenter in the beer fridge to chill the last 5 degrees to 20C or 68F before pitching my yeast. I didn't completely empty the fridge of other items, some beer and wine bottles in the CO2 bottle, and had to wedge the fermenter in, giving the fridge door a little shove to make sure it closed properly. Ah. Feeling pretty good at having yeah. 19 liters or 5 gallons of super hoppy APA ready to ferment, I moved on to my next project of the day. Fortunately, in some respects, I had cause to go back into the garage where the beer fridge is to find something for my next project. Upon opening the garage door, it took a few seconds for my brain to compute that I was staring at about 10 liters or 2.5 gallons of fresh-hopped APA all over the floor. <laughs> I opened the fridge door, and a waterfall of wort came gushing oh. out. <laughs> it seemed that in my shoving of the fridge door, I knocked the tap on the fermenter slightly, opening the valve and draining the wort. Oh. It wasn't a total loss as I was able to pitch the yeast of the remaining 9 liters or 2.4 gallons of wort, and it is now fermenting away. Oh, and my garage has a lovely Amarillo aroma, <laughs> even after a two-hour cleanup. <laughs> well, Pete from uh, Auckland, New Zealand. We have experience with cleaning up uh, sticky things mm -hmm. on the floor. Some sure do. Some uh, last longer than others. Nico in Seattle, Washington. Uh, I purchased a chest freezer a few months back to make a keezer, but I was uh, I was moving soon, so I figured I'd do the actual build afterwards. In the meantime, I used picnic taps, which I coiled inside on top of each keg. I just recently finished my move and took the time yesterday to get everything hooked up and chill for my first cold brew in my new place. Well, today, well, five minutes ago... Nick, Nico says, I opened the top of my freezer to pour my first cold brew and heard an odd scraping noise. Confused, I closed the top to see if it would make it again, and sure enough, the same short scraping noise. Now thoroughly confused, I opened the top again to once again hear it and notice that the keg in the middle rose up. <laughs> Levitating, as it were, I guess. The Lazarus ke <laughs> keg. Scraping against the one next to it and against the inside wall of the freezer. I tried to push it back down, but it was floating. Ah. I, I picked up the keg, which should have contained a fresh five-gallon batch I'd racked not one week ago, noticed it was empty, and saw the picnic tap sitting especially high up, resting on top of the gas connect, apparently high enough to be pressed by the freezer top coming down. Oh. As the realization of what happened hit me, I saw the foot-deep pool of beautiful, tragic brown liquid at the bottom of the freezer. Hmm. I'm still trying to process the loss of the entire batch of pale ale, which I'd not even gotten to sample before it met its unfortunate demise. I will be brewing a replacement tomorrow, which I will call Redemption Pale Ale. Hopefully it'll work out. Well, there you go. So that's a, it's another common theme is, is spigots or valves. Mm -hmm. uh being open and held open when they shouldn't be. Um, so we should we should develop a bingo game, you know, like the bingo games where you see where you're driving down the road and you see a fire truck, and so you put you know. You put, <laughs> that's right. If you if you irritate the the spouse, that's a check. If you you know a valve left open, then that's another check. <laughs> if you get sprayed with something, that's, that's you cover win. all four corners. Yeah, you yeah. win. Adri from uh, Zutphen. I'm going to say, in the Netherlands. Mm. Uh, as always, I'm looking forward to listening to the annual Homebrew Disaster episode of Basic Brewing Radio and listening to the stories. I always think, that'll never happen to me. <laughs> Another common theme. <laughs> yeah. Well, thinking that every homebrewer has to endure some sort of disaster once in a while. I forgot to send this one in last year and the year before, so I thought I'd send it in, I would send it in this year early. Um, a few years ago, I made a Vienna, and with the slurry of that Vienna, I brewed a strong golden lager with lots of noble hops. 
Both 25 liters or six gallons of nectar of the gods. The second one was supposed to be my Christmas holiday drink to impress my family and friends. Oh boy, they tasted good when I racked them into secondary. It was already cold in my brew house, so I put them both in my temperature-controlled fermentation cham- chamber and set the thermostat to 12 degrees Celsius, or 54 degrees Fahrenheit, so yeah. they could ferment out before cold lagering. We went away for a couple of days, letting the thermostat and the yeast do their work. You get another point for the thermostat. Oh, yeah. We were, when we returned after four days, I checked on my beers. When I entered the brew house, I noticed a funny plasticky aroma in the brew house. What could that be? I opened the fermentation chamber, and a hot breeze welcomed me, a very hot breeze. Hmm. I checked the temperature on the thermostat, and it said 75 degrees Celsius. That's 176 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> I read it again. Yes, yes, really. 75C or 176 degrees F. I felt the carboys and nearly burned my hand. As it turned out, the thermostat had failed to switch off the light bulbs when reaching 12 degrees Celsius or 54 degrees Fahrenheit, heating my loggers up to mash out temperatures. I quickly wow. turned off the light bulbs, but the harm was already done. In a day or so, I let the beers cool to 10 degrees Celsius or 50 Fahrenheit and reluctantly tasted both beers. If you ever want to know how artificially aged beer tastes, use a defective thermostat. <laughs> With tear-stained eyes, I had to pour my potentially prize-winning brews through, uh, through my sink. No homebrew that Christmas. You might remember the scene with the printer from the movie Office Space. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this That is where I got my inspiration for dealing with the thermostat. <laughs> you remember when they took the printer out in the, yeah. in the field and beat the heck out of it? He says, I'm looking forward to uh, listening, listening to the disaster show, and I wish you, your family, and Steve a Merry Christmas and wonderful and brewful 2015. Thank you very much. Thanks, Adri. This is quite a stack. Well, I'm telling you. We're well stacked. Fred uh, says, uh, I've been a listener to Basic Brewing Radio for the past few months and gleaned much help from your podcasts. Uh, you do a great job in providing a profound amount of pertinent information on many varied brewing topics. Uh, enough of the pleasantries there, Fred. I'm sorry. I'm skipping ahead. <laughs> but very, very nice of you to say all this stuff. I started homebrewing about a year ago with many traditional beer recipes, but have of recent migrated toward brewing unhopped herbal ales. Hmm. That's interesting. I want to tell you about one of my recent homebrewing disasters, which fortunately had a happy ending. I've been in the habit of brewing two ales at one time, each in a three-gallon carboy, into which I split a packet of dry yeast. At bottling time, I made up a dextrin solution for carbonation in one container, splitting it equally between the two brews. Okay. Okay. Well, I got distracted. That's another point. Yeah. <laughs> the game was on. <laughs> and ended up dumping all of that solution into one of the two brews. So, not wanting to make bottle rockets or throw my roux ale out, I decided to risk combining my coriander ale with my roux ale so that the carbonation would come out right. I sampled a bottle of the mixed roux a week after bottling and was quite impressed that the medicinal overtones of the roux beer were tamed quite nicely by the fruity, mellow oranginess of the coriander ale. Usually, herbal ales get their best after a few weeks of conditioning, so I have great hopes for this batch. Uh, one of the biggest fears that I had in brewing or beginning to homebrew was not to succeed in making a drinkable batch of beer or ale. Several dozen, uh, several dozen batches into it now, that is yet to happen. He says, homebrewing is really not that difficult compared to many other skills I've learned that are not so forgiving. Even one wort that has a yellow jacket flew into <laughs> Even one wort that had a yellow jacket fly into it while I was chilling in my backyard introduced me to the world of lambic ales <laughs> and their fantastic possibilities. It's <laughs> the best line so far. <laughs> the yellow jacket infused lambic ale. <laughs> Who needs... Oh, it's a stinger ending. <laughs> who needs a cool ship? We can just uh, have insects. That's right. Uh, Mike from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Two and a half years in the making. Uh, this started back around June of 2012. I had successfully made the agent or ancient orange recipe. You might have heard of that from, mm-hmm. the, from the internet. In two one-gallon containers. So naturally, I wanted to step up the game. I bought a five-gallon fermenter and carboy and all the tools needed for a large batch. 
The, stay, the day started out well enough, got the honey warm enough to pour, equipment was clean, and I was ready to go. It was worth noting that my wife was pregnant with her first child. Uh-oh. More on this later. You know, wife with the pregnant and the child and the, oh, boy, that's, that's <laughs> six or seven points right there. <laughs> so with everything ready, I began the process of adding the water to the bucket fermenter. I had the honey warmed up and, oh, okay. I, <laughs> He's talking about his wife or the honey. <laughs> the honey's warmed up. What are you doing? Messing around this beer. I don't get it. Good point. <laughs> uh, 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 okay. <laughs> Next, I had my oranges ready to be sliced and dumped into the bucket. Cinnamon sticks and cloves following closely behind. And finally, grab the raisins that are the yeast nutrient slash tannin for the recipe. Wait, raisins? Well, I forgot those. I guess I'll, it can still pitch yeast and throw them in tomorrow. A few hours won't hurt. Now, with everything, sans raisins. Didn't Sears have, wasn't that a line of slacks? The oh, sans raisins? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, sans raisins in the bucket. I closed it up and attempted to put the airlock on it. Except the little rubber grommet slash gasket that seals the open was giving me problems. With a bit more force, the airlock went in and, well, yeah... I had pushed the grommet out of the opening and into the must. Oh, boy. That's another point. We yep. the stopper in the uh, must, or the wort. To retrieve the little rubber gasket, I thought I could use a slotted serving spoon to sift through the must and fish out the little guy. Unfortunately, I was unsuccessful. Next idea was to just grab him out, but I didn't want to get my hand in contact with the must, so I decided to use a garbage bag, sanitize it, and use it as a large glove. <laughs> it worked. More of a mitten, I think. Yeah. I was finally able to get the gasket out, properly set it into the lid, and attach the airlock. Uh, uh, okay, so oh, you overcome that. I left the mead for a few months to ferment and decided to rack it to a carboy off the fruit and yeast cake to mellow out a bit before bottling. I didn't have any problems transferring the mead. This was around October or so. Also, by this time, we were in the middle of building a house. Mm. So where's the disaster part? What can be a disaster? You're building a house and you, you're about to have a kid. What can go wrong? Very little. Remember I said my wife was pregnant? Yes. Well, our little one was due at the end of December. Perfect. With the holidays and our daughter, I'd have enough time off so that I could bottle my mead. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Obviously the first child you've ever had. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Mike says, boy, was I naive back then. No sleep. Running here, running there. Working with the builder, finalizing interior design and such. But hey, the mead is okay. It has an airlock and will keep for a few more months. Plus, we weren't selling the old house, so I could keep it stored a little while longer. By February of 2013, remember he brewed this in June of 2012, mm -hmm. we were in the new house, my mead still sitting in the old house's closet. All should be well, except it wasn't. In the middle of packing for the move and taking care of the baby, the mead slipped my mind. Imagine that. Mm. It wasn't until my father-in-law started remodeling the old house that I remembered my mead. This was around June of 2013, so a year later. So looking at the mead, it seemed okay, except there was no water in the airlock. Oh, boy. That's another one. Yeah. And my father-in-law had been sawing and grinding and sanding, so it was a major dust storm around the carboy. I had to move it to another location and promptly forgot about it again. So finally, the renovation of the old house was complete, except where was my mead? Going back to finally retrieve my carboy, I didn't expect to see what I did. Nice particulate of drywall, dirt, and sawdust floating in the carboy, mm. added to the fact that the airlock is, had long since been dry. I wasn't even going to attempt to taste this stuff. So five gallons of mead over two years, wasted for nothing more than a story to tell. So, as a warning to parents-to-be, don't start brewing if it will coincide with the birth of your child. <laughs> Indeed. Plus, if you've ever tried to brew uh, with, uh, with a woman who is, is pregnant in the house, uh, at least with my wife, her, her sense of smell was, like, super mm -hmm. charged. So it's like superpower. So, you know, she hated the, the smell of uh, brewing beer. Mm. This is good. This hundred percent bright beer. That's really good. Really good. Jessica, um, it's good to hear. Uh, should I? <laughs> we should have a, a someone female come in and read this one. Mm -hmm. uh, Jessica says, "The last time I wrote, I was living in Columbus, Ohio. I recently moved to St. Paul, Minnesota. Boy, I hate that for you. And <laughs> there's no good beer around there. No, none. Holy smokes." 
<clears throat> and based on my two most recent brewing disasters, there have been some changes slash upgrades to my brewing bottling equipment. We had our wedding the last weekend in May. Congratulations. Yep. A lot of friends and family were coming in for the long Memorial Day holiday. With the upcoming move to Minnesota, I was trying to use what ingredients were left over and was sharing a lot of bottled home brews, uh, which is another theme, you know, the drinking of home brews during the process. I also had good intentions to have some kind of pale ale and cider ready for everybody during the rehearsal dinner and other gatherings. Renting a duplex, there was no where for my long-desired kegging system, but I had found the tap-a-draft system <clears throat> as the deal of the, of the day a while back. Well, I just... <laughs> editorial comments deleted. I decided it would be the perfect delivery system for the leftover clean-out ingredients beer. What I did not consider when I dry-hopped the tap-a-draft bottle was my hops were loose mm. and, and pellets... I will never make that mistake again. The result was a delicious beer that could not be dispensed through the insanely clogged liquid line that was submerged in hop matter. The worst part, that once taking the dispenser out of the bottle, the hops dispersed throughout the bottle and made what we were calling a thin milkshake consistency. The beer that could possibly have been salvaged ended up being dumped because of the honeymoon move, etc. This is a two-parter. Whoa. Jessica says... I thought that my losses were just going to be in beer and ingredients. However, in the shuffle of packing and cleaning for Minnesota, brewing equipment and cleaning sanitizing products were coming out of the woodwork. I was grateful to find uh, I still had a lot of star sand, and that seemed to be unaffected by the broken cap. Huh. <laughs> Foreshadowing. I wasn't sure on how to pack it, fearing it would spill and ruin anything it was packed with. I did not get the chance to see if it would ruin any packaged items, because later that day I noticed a picture frame had knocked the star sand over and it was pouring all over the laminate countertop. I wish I could have taken a picture of this to send your way. Full strength star sand does not play well with laminate countertops. Hmm. Luckily it was contained on the countertop that was about three square foot total, but it completely demolished any negotiations of a chance of getting a security deposit back. Still feel horrible about how this happened while thinking back on it. So she says, in the new house, I've learned from my mistakes. Mostly, I have my star sand in a dedicated five-gallon pail in the unfinished portion of the basement. Also, I now have a dedicated fridge in the garage for my draft system. Very nice. Mm -hmm. No dry hop addition mishaps yet. However, the temperature has already gotten so cold up here, I had a few beer slushies that creeped up out of the top of the kegs and out of the lines. But, you know, I will take beer slushies over hop milkshakes any day. <laughs> <laughs> and who wouldn't? <laughs> Oh my! Well, yeah, I've used the tapa draft thing. The thing I had a little incident with the tapa draft thing, in that um, it's this essentially a, a a PET. It's like a three liter pop bottle, right. you know, soda pop bottle, and you screw this thing on the top, and you've got these two CO two cartridges that you plug in. Yeah. Well, I didn't think I was getting enough carbonation, so I I like plugged in an additional CO two cartridge in, and shut the refrigerator door. And it overpressurized the thing, and the way the little spigot works, it just it basically just bends over this this vinyl hose, mm -hmm. and the pressure unbent it. Right. And there you go. Uh, it was a hot. It was a sticky, sticky mess. Sticky wicket. <laughs> mm. You're about to the end of your. Uh, we might be ready for the. Uh, the winter spiced ale or grog here soon we from might very well. from Lester. Lester? Yes. Lester. Steve from Albuquerque, New Mexico. My buddy and I were each brewing a beer on each of our systems together a couple months ago. His was a Shakespeare 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 Stout clone from Rogue, and mine was the Irish Red Ale from the book Brewing Classic Styles. Everything went great. We hit our temperatures and gravities cooled the wort down quickly, and transferred to our carboys. Everything went without a hitch. I used a three-gallon plastic better bottle, and my buddy used a six-gallon glass carboy with a brew hauler, of course. Well, there we mm -hmm. go. My friend hauled his glass carboy to the garage where his fermentation chamber was. As he gently set it on the ground, he noticed liquid coming from the bottom of the carboy. He soon realized that his carboy had cracked and quickly tried to find a solution. Oh, boy. Unfortunately, the wort was leaking too quickly to save it, and it all fell out on his garage floor. 
He was in the process of having his house remodeled, and the contractor had left his tools and some sandbags on the garage floor near where his carboy is broken. He was able to save himself the embarrassment of ruining the contractor's stuff by moving it quickly. I helped my friend hose down the garage floor before his wife came home. Fortunately, the Irish red ale was not part of the disaster and came out to be delicious. He rebrewed the clone the next month, and it turned out to be fabulous. So there's a happy ending there. Yeah. Indeed. So even with a uh, even with a brew hauler, you got to be careful setting that thing down. It doesn't have a maybe a brew maybe a brew hauler with a pad underneath. You know, could be a uh, an upgrade. You know, I left a uh, this isn't a brew hauler story, but it's a it's a carboy story. All right. So I left my car my very expensive six gallon carboy. I left it outside in the winter, <laughs> and I thought it was empty. I thought it was completely empty, and I just didn't think about it. But, of course, it did have some water in it, up to about the three- or four-inch line. And guess where it broke exactly even all the way around? At the water line? At the water line. And, boom, it's like you're taking a glass cutter to it. Wow. You, I picked it up, and I left the bottom of the – and I was, oh, my God. <laughs> you had a funnel. I sure did. You had a big glass funnel. <laughs> yeah. That's a heartbreaker. Yeah, it was. I found a mouse. I probably told this last year, but I found a mouse in a carboy. A oh. six gallon carboy, and it had been there so long that um, I hope you're not eating. But it, the, but the, but the mouse had decomposed, expanded, exploded, and seeped all kinds of stuff all over all over the bottom of the carboy. Mm. And I said, "Well, I'm done with that." Yeah, because uh, I know that, you know, and people you know on Twitter and everywhere said you could have cleaned that out. Yes, I could have, but I'm not gonna. Do, I'm not gonna be the one to drink the beer or wine that came out of the mouse. For a minute, <laughs> give it to Mikey. He'll eat anything. <sighs> what do we got next? What's up next on the hit parade? Adam from Kennebunk Park, Maine. Oh, says I've been brewing for about three and a half years, but only recently found out about Basic Brewing Radio. Where have you been, Adam? Yeah, what a pleasant find, he says. Well, there you go. I started from episode number one. I've been playing catch up for several months. Well. It's a shock when you get <laughs> when you get to the end and you have to wait for a week for an episode just like the rest of us. It's a shock. Okay. He says, here's my brewing disaster story. I think you're going to like it, and I can't wait to hear what Steve has to say about this one. Oh, boy. Back in August of 2011, I was living in upstate New York, and Tim, a musician friend of mine, mm -hmm. had made and shared a few extract batches with the band. I expressed an interest in home brewing, so within a week or two, we were making our first all-grain batch in my garage. The first brew session went really well. We gave it two weeks in the primary and two weeks in the secondary, then kegged it. We were so excited about brewing that while the first batch was in the carboys, we made three more five-gallon batches. Wow. So doing the math, we had 20 gallons of beer brewed before we tasted the first pint. <laughs> Risky, you Risky. say? Risky, yeah. <laughs> Adam says, well, upon tasting that first batch, we noticed a strange flavor. Couldn't put our finger on it. We continued to drink it, but didn't share it with anyone else. When the second batch was ready, which was a different style, we noticed the same odd flavor. Uh-oh, let the troubleshooting begin. We brewed in a cheap aluminum turkey fryer pot. And I had some concerns about that. We did some research and didn't find out much about aluminum pots producing terrible off flavors. We both have aluminum pots yeah. that we use. We don't have any problems. Mm -mm. We then focused our attention on the water supply. In preparation for each brew day, I figured I would be it would be very convenient to bring the water supply right into the garage via an old garden hose. <laughs> mm. <laughs> hmm. I began to recall drinking water from a garden hose as a kid and remembered that, though refreshing on a hot summer day, it didn't taste very good. <laughs> <laughs> we connected the dots and quickly realized there's only two dots. We connected the dots. <laughs> You're not drawing a horse here. <laughs> <laughs> There's only two dots, one and two. We connected the dots and quickly realized that the taste issue with our beers was a vinyl-esque bouquet, followed by a soft, musty plastic finish. <laughs> That's lovely. I New ate there last week at that restaurant. <laughs> New style, perhaps? <laughs> In true homebrewer fashion, we didn't dump one ounce of any of the four batches <laughs> produced with the hose water. <laughs> Fortunately for us, my wife's cousin was in town. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you got the wife and the cousin. <laughs> and at the time, he was more interested in the effect and cost of the beer rather than the flavor. That's the cousin you need. Yeah. Each day around 5 p.m., he announced the phrase, let's get hosed. <laughs> 
<sighs> and we would proceed into the basement for a round of uh, polymeric pints. Before we knew it, we had gone through all of the hose beer with no ill effects observed. Yet, anyway, uh, future batches were made with a stainless pot and filtered water from a potable supply, so the beer was vinyl-free, and most batches were pretty excellent. The experience served as a crash course in the importance of water quality in brewing. Hmm. You know, vinyl's coming back now. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> I even though there was a vinyl section in Walmart the other day, I was looking for some stuff and. Uh... Are you talking about clothing? No, 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 no. I'm talking about uh, music uh, records. Oh, okay, all right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but not beer. No. <laughs> Mike writes in, uh, huge fan of the show, especially the disaster episodes. Thought I'd share my worst horror story. I was attempting my most ambitious brew to date: seven gallons of a red IPA. Most of that would be served at my moving away party for my wife and I this past May. It was a cold day in April in Tulsa. Ah. So I was brewing in the garage to stay a bit warmer. Don't worry, I had the big garage door and the back door open for plenty of ventilation. You heard the uh, propane guy episode. The mm -hmm. propane guy and propane accessories episode. Everything was going great. Mash temperatures, hop schedules, etc. After the boil, I set the large 15-gallon brew pot by the back door. I put the sanitized chiller in, turned on the water, and stirred it around for a while. I left the chiller in the pot and went inside to go to the restroom and finish sanitizing the fermenting buckets while the wort finished chilling. There's something about leaving the pot to go to the pot <laughs> that's, that, ha that seems problematic to me. <laughs> leaving one pot for the other. That's right. <laughs> I stepped out into the garage into a river of wort. The hose connection to the chiller had broken but stayed in the brew pot. This caused the pot to fill up and overflow. I also learned that my garage at the time was not level, as evidenced by the, <laughs> wort, by the wort River running from the back door to the driveway. The batch was ruined, and we even ended up too busy to have the going away party. Oh, Aww. that's sad. I finally successfully brewed the beer this past summer. Once, me, once we had moved to Salt Lake City, it was great. I have referred to this recipe as the Red River IPA ever since. <laughs> John from Maryland. Hi, John. Uh, we have a local beer fest, and our homebrew club puts on homebrewing demonstrations. I was brewing a brew in a bag brown ale for my demonstration. Inevitably, I was asked the isn't it risky to drink and could it harm you question. As always, I laughed the question off, stating the usual no homebrewing is safe mini rant foreshadowing. Yeah. I was opening a bottle of cider at the time and karma came calling. While explaining how homebrew is safe, I broke the neck of the bottle off and at the same time removed a good amount of skin from my index finger. <laughs> well, <laughs> luckily, we have very good paramedics. I was stitched up and completed my brew day with one less finger. The brown ale I brewed has now been renamed to Busted Knuckle Brown Ale. <laughs> I learned that checking your bottles every now and then for cracks might be a good idea, or at least keeping you from making a scene at the local beer fest. So, yes, the beer itself can't hurt you, but the vessel in which it is contained... Being well, the blessed. vessel with the pestle has the brew that is true. <laughs> the flagon with the dragon. <laughs> yeah, I can't remember the rest. <laughs> hey, you're out of beer. I'm out of beer. Mm. What did you rinse and uh, and spit? Rinse and dispense. Rinse and dispense. While uh, while I read this next one. All right. Aaron. <clears throat> um, after much apprehension, I figured I would share my brewing disaster. It was January of this year, 2014, and the kegs were running low. My seasonal dark high-gravity beers were on the verge of running their course, and I felt that my Sierra Nevada clone would be my best choice for the brew day. The snow was falling, and temperatures here in northeast Ohio were in the single digits. I should add that I have a garage that was converted to a rec room, which makes a great area to brew in our cold Ohio winters. Things started off interesting. When I underestimated how cold the grain was and totally missed my mark on the temperature. No big deal. I boiled some water to bring it up. Fast forward and the boil was going great. My brewing area was nice and warm from the burner and all was well. Uh, uh, I, I, I'm just going to read this. I don't know. <laughs> I with my tap water I with my tap water temps nice and low I decided to use my immersion chiller and the tap was just outside the door. My spigot is antiseptic and water was turned off 
So temps should not be an issue, right? Wrong. As soon as I was ready to chill, I ran to the basement and turned on the water, and the spigot snap. Hmm. The water instantly froze in the line, and it burst. Down to the basement for tools, I tracked snow, <laughs> foreshadowing, I tracked snow up my five painted stairs into the house. After a quick hose repair and another loud snap, I was beginning to realize I had totally underestimated how cold it really was outside. I should also mention that I brew ten gallons at a time, and getting my wort to boil allowed me to have multiple home brews. And yes, <laughs> I know the dangers of this. There he goes, another tick on the thing. After warming the lines and burning my spigot with a propane torch, the wort was chilling rather quickly. Just about cool enough to transfer it to my buckets. And what do I see? My shiny, unopened bags of pellet hops sitting in the table. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> in an infuriated panic mode, I restarted the burner, added the, <laughs> added the hops, and poured another oh, homebrew. Lord. Relax, I thought to myself. These things happen. 2 a.m. <laughs> I love this writing style. It's like James Joyce. <laughs> Name this beer Ulysses. <laughs> After writing a few ex expletives in my logbook, I think we should put a field for that, I walked into the house to check on my <laughs> tired and unimpressed wife sleeping on the couch. The wife, she's another tick there. Upon returning to my brew station, my transition down the wet painted stairs went a whole lot faster than planned. Mm. My feet were about as high as my head from the second stair, putting me horizontal about four feet above the staircase. The landing didn't go very well either, with my kidney absorbing most of the fall in the corner of the bottom step. Bruised, battered, and tired. I finished That's my, my law firm. <laughs> Bruised, battered, and tired. Yeah, they're not very good. <laughs> <laughs> they specialize in car wrecks. <laughs> I finished my brew day slash evening around 4 a.m. and surrendered to my bed. Fast forward again to spring, and the Sierra Nevada clone was the best I ever made. Wow. And it went down well, as he did down the steps, <laughs> right. while fixing my spigot that froze and busted because I forgot to turn off the water in my basement all winter. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> I will share my other brewing disaster with you as soon as it is close, <laughs> as soon <laughs> as it is a close second to this one. Oh, oh my Lord. God. That's uh, Aaron from Ohio. Was it Ohio? Super uh, cold. Yeah. Luke. Uh, Where? <laughs> Luke, <laughs> use the force to brew, Luke. Yeah. <laughs> My, oh, what is this? I no, don't know. This is the, from uh, Lester, the winter spiced ale or grog. This is 8.5% alcohol. Oh. Cheers. Cheers. It's good. It's very um, mm. wintry. Oh. Yeah. Oh. That's tasty. Kind of raisiny oh. and... Yeah. I don't know what all is in there, so I hate to speculate, but it, yeah, it's got all that Christmas good It's Christmas got brown stuff. sugar. It's got yeah. orange peel. It's got a cinnamon stick. Yeah. Um, one cup of busted barrel rum. That's what I did. There you go. That uh, that took me back to college. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was under a car there for a minute. That was my nickname in college. <laughs> busted barrel. <laughs> busted barrel rum. Yeah. I tried it for the football team, but I was, <laughs> I was a sleep off. I couldn't quite make it. <laughs> they just left me on the bench. You were a brown shirt freshman. <laughs> <laughs> I was a two-track freshman. Luke. Luke oh. writes, my, <laughs> my uncle hooked me up with two free soda kegs for home brewing because he, he did not – because he did that, I told him I would make him a brew for his end-of-summer party. Because he gave me the kegs in August and his party was in September, I decided to make an ale-toberfest. I had made an Oktoberfest in March, and that turned out to be delicious. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I should also mention we're on – both of us have taken cough – or I had a Zyrtec D this morning. Oh, I had a muscle relaxer. <laughs> <laughs> I hurt my back. This is for real. And so, you know, I took a muscle relaxer, and, and I'm on this 8.5% beer. So look out, Myrtle. Here I come. <laughs> okay. When I was making the Ale-toberfest, I realized right before I – I put my submersion wort chiller into the wort that there was a break in the copper tube. You've had one Ooh. of those. Oh, yeah, I have. So I had no way to cool down the wort. No sink was big enough for the pot, so the only thing I could do was to add cold water and wait and wait and wait. After it cooled, I hoped 
the yeast would take care of anything that may have gotten in, into it, but let's face it, that's just wishful thinking. We kegged and carbonated the beer and got got it to the party, and it was just plain bad. Here's the here's the payoff. Okay. It was so bad that I think I created a new style of beer, the Proctoberfest. Oh! <laughs> because it was kind of crappy. Yeah. Well, you should go back to the other guy that had a rectal, some, a rec room. <laughs> Because, I mean, his, his proctologist had a rectal room. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and we got, we got we lots got, to go. We got a lot to go. Many miles to go before we start. Uh, my wife suggested we do a two-parter. We might yet. Yeah. Magnus in Oslo, Norway. Oh, he says he challenged us to try to pronounce his last name. Okay, let me give it a shot. Okay. Smith. Yeah. <laughs> Wrong. Scott. I'm going to say Skovdal. That's Smith in Norwegian. Oh, okay. Well, no, I don't know. <laughs> I'm sure I'm wrong about that. <laughs> okay. Magnus says, um, I was bottling a blueberry wheat amongst a few other brews that night. It was getting late. I was tired and overstimulated, probably because I had numerous episodes from you guys and blaring in the background. Well, <laughs> that'll do it to you. Anyhow, don't blame me for that. <laughs> anyhow... So blueberries that managed to sneak over during siphoning kept clogging up the old bottling cane. Insert joke here. <laughs> that... That's what Zyrtec does to me. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> I call it prostate relief. <laughs> I, re I really didn't want to put my hands down the bucket. Who <laughs> would? <laughs> I really didn't want to put my hands down the bucket to clear things up, so I decided... <laughs> <laughs> you to, can do it. To not so gently put the bottling bucket at some sort of angle just to make it flow a bit better. It won't help with Zyrtec either. Big mistake. Whilst balancing the bucket, taking sips of homebrew, listening to you, uh, you guys and trying to watch the level of each bottle I filled, I somehow managed to tip the whole bucket over. Oh. The bucket was on my big desk com containing my computer, printer, keyboard, and other computer-associated equipment, industrial lamp, a really nice stereo with speakers, and a vintage amp from the 70s, Aww. and Aww. a bunch of audio equipment, cables, and vinyl, mm -hmm. and uh, audio interfaces and such. Uttering such wor words, uttering words seldom heard coming from this gentleman's mouth, <laughs> they probably, <laughs> they'd be a Norwegian, we wouldn't know what he was saying. No. <clears throat> uh, all the while Slipping on sticky blueberry weizen and trying to limit the amount of spillage, I managed to gather a bunch of towels and rags from the bathroom to kind of soak up, kind of soak up the worst of it. After what was probably just 15 to 20 minutes, several hours, several hours of hard labor with brooms, water, rags, pulling out anything electronically connected, I went to bed feeling not too satisfied. But wait, there's a happy ending to all this. I realized the next morning that most of the beer just went under all the various equipment just had to dry off everything with some damp rags. Okay, the desk, all the equipment, and the floor stayed sticky for a couple weeks. But, oh, what'll happen? But no real harm done in the end. Well, nobody wants harm done in the end. No. And I, which <laughs> brings back the, the old bottling cane. <laughs> <sighs> you know, <laughs> we're, do, we're, we're devolving into a uh, uh, theme. Yeah. And I actually managed to bottle uh, 12 to 13 liters of the beer, which turned out pretty delicious. There you go. Uh, Brian, here's a quick version of mine. Was hosting a group brew at my place. I had a stuck sparge and a 120-pound grain bill. Not cool. Blick, Blickman drain tube became dislodged. It's better than a grope brew. You get arrested for those. <laughs> so we had to empty part of the ton, then put my hand with winter gloves on in a grain bag to act as a giant glove to so, get it put back in. So it was a, a grope brew. <laughs> That's right, literally. <laughs> this was after one of the people in the group brew tossed their grains into the hot liquor tank thinking it was the mash tun. Oh, <laughs> Eventually, he dropped his glass carboy full of beer later that weekend. Good Lord. Karma is a bitch, he said. He, <laughs> yeah. he needed a brew hauler. Yeah. It was a cold day. took a while to boil because of the wind. Used cornhole boards as windscreen. I'm not going there. <laughs> <laughs> not going there. It's too easy. Almost set my, <laughs> almost set my pants on fire. <laughs> Then, mine got hit with Brett. It was an Oktoberfest when the airlock went dry while I was on vacation. See, never it, leave the beer. 
finally decided to serve it in a firkin. Ended up being a great beer. <laughs> I'm sure it did. I can give you the long version if you want. That's what he said. That's what he said. That's plenty. That's a plenty. Ron from Springfield, Missouri. Uh, we had a beer from there today. That's right, we did. Ooh, speaking of beer. Let's all go to the lobby. <laughs> Boy, mm. this may be the longest show ever. Ron from Springfield, Missouri. I have a chest freezer, which has been adapted to work as my lagering chest through the addition of a temperature controller. Had some house guests who were interested in seeing my brewing setup mm -hmm. around that time. So I showed them my brew room, which doubles as our laundry room. I have a refrigerator, which, which has three taps in the door, because there's room inside for three quarter kegs. I try to have beers in the pipeline, so that whenever I... <laughs> I I've got some beers in the pipeline right now. <laughs> so that... <laughs> Waiting for early release? But the Zyrtec... <laughs> But whenever I have a keg to run dry, I have something ready to refill the empty keg. So at the time in question, I had three glass carboys chilling happily in the aforementioned chest freezer with the temperature set at 38 degrees. This is another tick on the thing. Mm -hmm. Well, when the house guests wanted to have a tour of the brewery, I happily showed them all parts of the operation. <laughs> well, it's been a long time since I showed everybody all the parts in the operation, including op <laughs> opening the chest freezer and proudly showing off the 15 gallons of aging beer. Well, at some point during all this effort, I managed to unknowingly drag the temperature probe out of the freezer ah. and letting it dangle in the room air. This went unnoticed until a few weeks later, I was brewing another beer and set the fermentation carboy atop the chest freezer and happened to look at the display on the temperature controller, which read 61 degrees. My heart sank. I knew immediately what was going on. After a two-second investigation, I found the temperature probe hanging out in the room air. Uh. I opened the chest freezer to find three shattered carboys and 15 gallons of slush in the bottom of the freezer. Checked the actual temperature in the freezer, and it was a chilly 16 degrees. That's Fahrenheit, which would be colder, about 10 below on the, uh, on the Celsius thingy. So I had a job to do. Turned off the freezer, opened the door, and let it warm up. Then had to carefully remove the shards of glass, the ice balls. <laughs> you don't want to get those. No, that's almost as bad as dough balls. <laughs> or sauerkraut, Mary sauerkraut balls. <laughs> <laughs> the ice balls that remained inside the glass and threw them out into the yard to thaw. And then spent a lot of time mopping up the beer, a mixture of three different brews that had all commingled in the bottom of the freezer. I had to go buy three new glass carboys and learn from this experience. I now take extra care to make certain the temperature probe is, in fact, hanging in the depths of the freezer and that it is reading what I expect it to read. Good heavens. Wow. Yeah. That's a mess. Break. Break. This is this is real life. So I tweeted a picture of you, re you know, reading. Yes. And I'm getting brewing disasters on twi Twitter. <laughs> and so then I tweeted out, send me your brewing disasters via Twitter. We're recording now. Oh, God. Now we, no, but we don't have to read any of them. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's just I mean, this is closing the closing the social media loop. <laughs> you realize I'm not gonna edit that out, right? <laughs> I do. You're teasing people on Twitter. You're a Twitter tease. I'm a Twitter tease. <laughs> well <laughs> Joe from Canapolis, North Carolina. My disaster story does not happen on Brew Day. Brew Day actually went well as I, as I could have hoped. It was a party gal brew. My first runnings were a barley wine that I've now mailed out as gifts for the holiday. Original gravity 1100. Final gravity 1010. Woo, holy smokes. Yeah, no kidding. My second runnings had a future in the keg to be enjoyed at home. Had. Six gallons into the fermenter. Original gravity 1048. I was very happy with the brew day. The next morning, a quick glance as I left for work left me even happier as both airlocks were bubbling aggressively. That week was a very busy work week, and I never had the opportunity to check on it. Uh. Sunday, I brewed. Saturday was the realization of disaster. My son has moved out, so his room now has a guest now is a guest room slash fermentation room. Hmm. Uh, my son is a senior in well, like high that. school. Yeah. My primary fermenters are twelve gallon plastic buckets that I've drilled holes near the bottom for ball valves. As I walked into the room, I felt the wet, squishy carpet in between my toes. Panicked, I turn on the lights to see barley wine okay. 
But my second runnings, which was at the six-gallon mark on Sunday, was now at the two-gallon mark. Oh, boy. As quickly as I could, I sanitized bottles, heated priming sugar, and bottled only 17 beers. Turns out I created a small tear in the bucket at the hole when I installed a ball valve. My wife is very supportive of the hobby. But I had to shampoo the carpet five times over the next seven days to keep it that way. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> it took just as long to get rid of all the fruit flies and smell. Whew. You had to – well, we, we've told your, your mopping the must story the, of, the, of our mead-making adventure. We must. We must. <clears throat> we must, must mop the bus. <laughs> <laughs> we must mop the floor. Yeah. We get in trouble. Our friend Avi from uh, Iceland. Uh, Reykjavik? <laughs> just wanted to ask. <laughs> Killed them both. <laughs> Killed them both. That's good. Okay. Wrecked him, Jimmy. <laughs> okay. Well, I thought I killed him. <laughs> it's okay. That's a joke from junior high. Yeah. Okay. Somebody out there has heard that joke. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> As we've covered on your show... Uh, A.B. says, um, my system is electric brew in a bag, a single vessel recirculated system. It served me very well and was getting very comfortable. As I might have, I might have gotten a bit too comfortable with it last summer when I woke up one morning to brew. I have a PID controller to set the temperature and a I mean, thermocouple is located in a T connection in front of the spigot. You got I'm already a middle, lost. Middle bit. <laughs> Which means I need to run the pump and recirculate while I heat the strike water. On this particular day, I did what I often do, filled up my brew pot, got the pump going, turned on the automatic heating, and went inside to have my morning coffee. Again, don't yep. leave the beer. Don't leave the beer. The coffee was very nice, but this is about the last thing that day that wasn't horrible. About 20 minutes mm-hmm. later, I went up to my garage and turned on the recording studio slash brewery. I should preface what comes next by saying that I spent a lot of time renovating my garage. It's got laminate flooring. Electric heat in the floors. It's my working and hobby space. So I walk out there, and the hose for the recirculation has come loose. Yeah. All the water is now on and under the laminate floor, oh. and the heating element is running dry. I yank the lead out of the socket and promptly have a minor nervous breakdown. Then it's towel time. <laughs> and I try to get as much of the water up off the floor as I can. Once that's done, I try to assess the damage. Everything mm. plastic and rubber from my recirculation manifold is now in blob form. Mm. After I calmed down a bit, I realized that when I got there, the heating element was still running. So I figured, what the hell, I'll see if it still works. I'll put some water in there, and lo and behold, there's heat. So I decided to go ahead with the day's brew. See, you get extra credit for for going ahead. Perseverance. It was a big imperial stout for a barrel project me and a friend have going, and there was a bit of time pressure. We had a 200-liter Maker's Mark barrel to fill up. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. So I I, drained one of those (laughs) ones. That was a long weekend. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But I've never filled one. (laughs) Well... (laughs) This is Zyrtec. So I heated a new batch of water and went ahead with a mash. It was the biggest mash I'd done on the system. Thankfully, I have a pulley system, so I didn't think the weight of the bag would be a problem. And, of course, I turned out to be disastrously mistaken. As I began to try to pull the bag, the pulley came down from the ceiling, dropping the bag heavily onto the pot and oh. splattering me with hot wort. Oh. I looked frantically and couldn't find our electric drill. Turned out my wife thought the best place to store it would be an old suitcase in the storeroom. Wait. <laughs> this is a man that's just been splashed with hot wort. His first reaction is to look for the electric drill. Well, he's got to he's got to put the pulley back up. He's got to save the beer. But he could he could be scalded. He could be headed to the hospital. He's from Iceland. He's tough. Oh, okay. Reykjavik? <laughs> Kill them both. <laughs> <laughs> and com- oh, and company had arrived for dinner, so there's oh, the thing. <laughs> it's starting to sound like a Faulty Towers episode. <laughs> Don't mention the war. <laughs> so I decided to cut my losses and boil the next day. After properly fastening the pulley again the day after, I finally got the grain out, sparged by pouring hot water through the hanging bag, well, and proceeded to boil. As I was making a huge beer, I decided to do an extended boil. I set the power on the heating element rather low and boiled for four to five hours. Yeesh. And when it was all over, it turned out the word had burned on the heating element. And not just in spots, there was a thick pitch black shell of burned sugar coating on it. And the wort tasted like ash. Ooh. That's ash. Ash. <laughs> 
I ended up dumping the batch and brewing it again at a friend's house a bit later. And and uh, he sent a follow up. He said the uh, the ne- He said I forgot the ending. The next brewing session after I replaced everything went really well. Then as I was cleaning up, I dropped my blue po- my blue pot my brew pot to the floor. I have a twelve volt pump that's attached directly to the spigot, and it snapped off. Oh my god! <laughs> so there you go. You get you got you got. I've got I've got some live Twitter disasters. You want to read two those? Of them. I, I have two. I'll it's drink. drink. Yes. Uh, Jim Smith uh, tw- tweets in, tweets in that he uh, had a quick disconnect hose break the first time he used it on a new brew system, spilling hot wort all over his new brew house. Much sadness, big mess. I like these. <laughs> I like these tweets because it's 140 characters. Exactly. Or less. Yeah. Jim Jim Ferrier says that uh, uh, he forgot to send one in this year. Exclamation point. <laughs> Reykjavik. <laughs> I, caught, I caught myself. He caught himself on fire. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> he says, don't wear jorts. No, no, what? It says jorts. J-O-R-T-S. What's a jort? I think it's a short. But it's got to be something jort. else. And nope. Gym the answer, shorts? The answer is moops. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> on brew day. <laughs> and no bear was lost. You gotta Google jorts. <laughs> I don't know what a jort is. Well, that's what the Google is for. You have the world at your fingertips. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's our, what she said. Our friend, our friend Noam from Israel. We met Noam yep. at the yes. the conference. Had lunch at a sushi bar. Probably more than you need to know. Yep. <clears throat> okay. Noam says. Here's my most recent brewing disaster. I have a 100-liter oak barrel that has a sour Solera running in it for about a year now. Not, it's not disastrous at all. <clears throat> I have drawn out 20 liters six months in and recently racked out another 10 liters about 12 months into the project. As this barrel is never emptied and cleaned, I'm afraid that a big yeast sediment is collecting at the bottom. And so I tried to get out my auto siphon all the way to the very bottom and dry out some of the yeast. I used a piece of tubing as an extension. Well, who hasn't? (laughs) Duh. (laughs) Well, it fell off in the barrel. So now I have a a Solera project with a piece of plastic tubing at the bottom of the barrel. Disastrous, isn't it? Oh. Well, it's not so disastrous. No, no, no. Those yeast will enjoy playing in and around that tubing. That's right. It's like tubing. Or stubing. I would like to tell you. Captain stubing. I looked up jorts. Did you? I did. Only I use Google Maps. I found out that <laughs> <laughs> I hit the wrong button. But I found out that there's a Jortslunda in Sweden. There's a Jortsku River in Georgia and Jortsler on Crew Road in the United Kingdom. Well, there you so go. just so you know. Don't brew there. You'll catch no. on fire. Or in a Jortsu Oi in Finland. <laughs> That's what you say when you catch on fire. <laughs> Jortslu Oi! <laughs> Chris from Petersburg, Ontario, Canada. <clears throat> We're so international. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had my five-liter starter on my stir plate, my wife's office, on Christmas Eve. There's your there's, first mistake. There's a mistake, yeah. Family were here, and we were having a good time. Then I heard this crashing sound from upstairs, like a chair falling over. <laughs> I thought that one of our grandkids fell off a bed or something like that. <laughs> my wife said, there's nobody up there. Ooh. I then knew what it was. Yep. My five liter starter, that five liter is a big starter. Yeah, no kidding. Fell off the stir plate and was all over the office floor. The flask oh. didn't break, but what a mess. I used a dozen towels to clean it up, plus cleaning it with Pine Sol, product placement, to get the smell out of the room. This was my Pilsner yeast, too, White Labs uh, 940. I'm now going to make a wooden box to surround the stir plate so no matter what happens, it won't go anywhere. So this That's Chris a good from idea. Petersboro. Peterborough, Ontario, Canada. I blame Santa Claus. Christmas Eve, you hear some yep. ra- uh, from my wife's office. I heard such a cla- arose such a clatter. It, I, I went up the stairs to see what was the matter. Ants. <laughs> John John from Jericho, Vermont <laughs> says ants. <laughs> remember I that, know where this is going. Remember the thing from, from Sprockets? Ants. 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 I thought it's Andalusian dog all over again. I thought I'd share my homebrew disaster. It started when I invited my buddy over to show him how to brew. Well, there's your first mistake. Yeah. Just send him one of our DVDs. I brewed a couple of batches, and I was feeling pretty confident in showing my friend how to brew a batch of beer while my wife was away shopping. Again. Again. Two points. 
The beer was supposed to be a high-gravity stout at around 9% ABV. Everything was going fine until uh, we added the hops to the wort. He was sitting at the table, about 12 feet away, and he asked me a question. As soon as I turned to answer his question, the boil over was everywhere. <laughs> so it's his <laughs> friend's fault. It covered my whole element stove and all over the sides as well. It took us about an hour to clean up and then return to finish the boil. The rest of the brew day went as well as expected up until a couple weeks later. I came to the kitchen one morning to find a whole nest of ants on the side of my mm. stove. On the side of my st of the stove that my friend had cleaned. Sure enough, after I pulled the stove out of the countertop, I saw he never cleaned the counterside to where the, where the stove sits next to. It took me about a month to completely eradicate the ants and a bit of money my wife and I invested in. To this day, she has no idea why the ants were in the house. <laughs> and glad she doesn't listen to basic brewing. <laughs> we can arrange that. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> for, a small fee, for a small fee, we won't tell your wife to listen to that. <laughs> so it's all his friend's fault. He was his friend said something. He turned to answer his friend. The boil over happened, and then his friend didn't clean the stove. What do you think of red china? <laughs> <laughs> it's great on a yellow tablecloth. <laughs> I don't know, Mister Non Sequitur. <laughs> Russ from Portland, Oregon. Yeah, no, no good beer up there. No, none. <clears throat> we said sarcastically. There's tons of great beer up there, of course. Okay, uh, it was a balmy July day. And my brew partner, Scott, and I were in his backyard where we normally brew in our three kegel system. Everything was chugging along. Water came up to strike temperature, doed in right on the numbers, and, and the mash was in progress. We don't have the best insulation, just two wraps of foil over bubble wrap insulation, so we lost a degree or two and turned the bar burner on low. Temperature came back as normal, and I turned the heat off. In case you're wondering, as everyone has their regular brew day tasks... Mine, for some reason, is never to adjust that burner. Perfect time to grab another beer, I think. There you, there go. you go. As Scott heads off to work on something else. I should see if we're losing temp again. Yikes! The temperature is 180 degrees Fahrenheit. 82.2 C. <clears throat> Apparently, the regulator sticks when you turn it off, and you have to be certain that it pops off and shuts off. Who knew? <laughs> I, sc I scream for Scott. Great, Scott! But... <laughs> But he was still working. All right, he was in the bathroom. <laughs> well, it, <laughs> and it was yeah. not going to be help fat or fast help. I'm on my own. Must cool down wort fast. I look around for something to to use to chill wort. Hmm, chill, chill. No ideas. Aha, the hose. Since I didn't want to soak the whole garage in one Herculean move, I scooped the full mash tun, uh, ten gallons off the burner and down the grass to a few feet outside and then proceed to hit the outside of the kegel with the summer groundwater. Yep, not really helping. There must be a better way to chill this. I know, I'll add cold water. Brilliant. I turn the hose into the mash tun, adding who knows how much at what <laughs> and who knows what temp and stirring like mad. That did it. 140 degrees Fahrenheit, 60 degrees Celsius. Oops, not quite the 152 degrees Fahrenheit or 66.7 degrees C that we were shooting for. Scott came back outside and helped me pick the ton back up to the burner, and we got the, to the temp and mashed for about an hour and a half, but the wort and final beer had a starchiness to it that <laughs> was just not really nearly as good as this beer can be. We'd made it before and have since uh, with much better results. I uh, do appreciate the fact that although he did ask, he never chided me too hard about why I didn't just grab the immersion chiller to get the temperature down. <laughs> yeah, I wish I'd thought of that. Yeah. <laughs> That's Russ up in Portland. Grant. Grant's from Birmingham, Bur as they would say in England, Birmingham. Birmingham? Birmingham, Alabama. We say Birmingham. Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, Grant. And he wanted to share his brewing disaster for the upcoming brewing disasters podcast. It's been, it's, that was always a while. Hmm? Woo, we've been talking for a while. Yes, we have. You're out of beer. There's a there's a pomegranate ale in there if you want one. I think I do. In the fridge. Okay. <clears throat> My fiance likes strawberry beers, so last spring I decided to brew one for her. I brewed the base beer and let it ferment for about a week. Then went to the local farmer's market and brought some strawberries. Strawberries had just come in season, and the ones I bought were extremely flavorful. 
Still, I'd read that strawberries don't contribute much flavor to beer, so I decided to add them in great quantity. All told, about eight pounds of strawberries went into my five-gallon batch of beer. Wow. I chopped up the strawberries and froze them overnight. I then stuffed the strawberries into a muslin grain bag, added them to a five-gallon carboy. Can you imagine? Let's think about that. Eight pounds of strawberries in a muslin bag going through the neck of a five-gallon carboy. That's dedication. Yeah, I'm telling you. And racked my fermented base beer on top. Within a day, the remaining yeast in the beer started to vigorously ferment the sugars in the strawberries. I became worried that there was not enough headspace in the carboy to accommodate the fermentation. But for the next few days, everything seemed fine. Then, disaster struck. One morning before I left for work, I went to check on the carboy. There was a lot of foam surrounding the strawberries, but there was no airlock activity. <laughs> hmm. Confused, <laughs> yeah. I removed the airlock and noticed that a piece of the grain bag containing the strawberries had pushed itself up through the opening where the airlock was inserted. Apparently, it was blocking CO2 from escaping. God, this thing didn't blow up on him, did it? <laughs> Shh. <laughs> no spoilers. I took a racking cane and pushed the strawberry bag back into the carboy in a gusher of... Oh, no, wait. Down into the beer. As soon as I pushed the strawberries down, a bunch of CO2 came out of suspension, and beer exploded through the top of the carboy in a gusher of pink foam. It sprayed all over my clothes and all over the carpet. <laughs> <laughs> Needless to say, I was late for work that day. I managed to salvage. Why'd you say it? <laughs> I ma <laughs> Smell editing class. <laughs> Needless to say. Needless to say, don't say it. <laughs> I managed to salvage most of the beer, and it turned out pretty good. However, I'm left to wonder what would have happened if I had not removed the yeah. strawberry bag obstruction that day. I think it's entirely possible that I could have had a carboy bomb on my hands. Yes. God, am I? It's good, yes. Yeah, I mean, I really thought that. Yeah, good. You best. What I've learned from this experience is to always have plenty of headspace when adding fruit to the fermenter. In fact, I no longer add fruit to the secondary. Instead, I wait until primary fermentation is winding down, and then I add fruit to the primary fermenter and leave it for about a week. I conduct primary fermentations in plastic buckets with plenty of headspace, so there's little chance of similar disaster striking. There you go, Grant. Yep. That's that's one of my favorites, the pink pink explosion there, the pink geyser. Mm -hmm. I named a beer that once. The pink geyser. Mm -hmm. Now, look, he's going to the fridge, the the POM beers, POM. And, or anything in there that you want. Come on, you better not say that around me. <laughs> it's like Andy's magic beer fridge, anything you want. Joe Mann from Chesterfield, Virginia. <clears throat> this is a good one. Okay. Well, they're all good. But what's that? Are. What's that say? It's a P-O-N. Oh, it's a pomegranate. Yeah. Pomegranate beer. Yeah, we've had that on the video podcast. Yeah. And I think it's gotten much more tasty over time. Where the yeast and the uh, uh, pomegranate, it's real tasty. Okay. Okay. Joe says, I've been a home brewer going on four years, and this year was my epic sode brewing disaster. Epic sode. I always listen to brewing disasters with the hope that I myself can avoid such painful things. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess it is inevitable that it was my turn. In my defense, I would say this came at the end of a 12-hour day of cleaning equipment and bottling previous brews. Oh, Lord. I... <laughs> what does this tell you? <laughs> Don't brew tired. Right. I work retail and have not had a lot of time to take care of this. Oh, wow, well, he's got never work retail. He's got, he's got to take. <laughs> Always work wholesale. <laughs> only suckers. <laughs> only suckers, suckers work, work retail. retail. <laughs> <laughs> Just uh, uh, okay. So I drew a line, and so he, the the point is, that he only had a few had a limited time to do this. What? How is that? It, this pomegranate beer is just downright delish. Isn't it good? It's very good. It's gotten a lot better since we first tasted it. Okay. Uh, okay. So he drew a line in the sand and said, "Today was the day." So the poor beer that met its premature demise was a cluster brew. <laughs> now, before you answer, yeah, I'm not going to say a word. <laughs> my brew club puts on this competition once a year. Three or more brewers meet up to brew a beer in hopes to learn from each other. Our brew day went off. So that's why they call it a cluster brew, because the three, because more than one brewer gets together. To that's not brew. why I call it a cluster brew. Well, it turned into cluster something else, but that's another thing. Our, <laughs> our brew day went off without any problems. 
We all went through our ideas around and designed a mango lemongrass beer with sriracha ace hops and dried mango powder. Hmm. I was in charge of fermentation and bottling. I tasted the brew before bottling day and felt it would benefit from some milk sugar to take the edge off the tart bitterness of the citrus flavors. So I carefully measured the milk sugar and corn sugar before I went to bottle. I sanitized the bottles and th set them on the rack to let them dry. I looked at the time and realized how late it was, and the feeling of being rushed overwhelmed by my good judgment. I cleaned and sanitized my bottle bucket and auto siphon in a hurry. Then I thought to myself that I could save some time and start the siphon, and then run downstairs to my stove to get the sugars to a boil. Great idea, right? Right. The siphon started, so I ran downstairs to the kitchen to start my boil. It was at this point that I felt the day was one of the most productive beer days that I'd had in a long time. Oh, this, is, this can't end well. Then I heard a dripping sound from the next room. <laughs> I went to investigate to discover that a brownish liquid was dripping from the ceiling. <sighs> Remember, he's downstairs. Yep. I was in complete denial until the smell of mango and lemongrass grasped my nose. Oh, flickety foreign filth. <laughs> Look at these foreign says. filth. <laughs> I ran upstairs, skipping over every other stair to reach what I was sure to be the worst part of my day. Without desired disappointment, there on the floor was about four gallons of the beer obeying the laws of gravity. It was apparent that I did not successfully assemble my bottling bucket after cleaning it. I rushed to salvage what I could while maintaining the integrity of what was left. Midway through cleaning up my blunder, I heard the smoke detector drawing my attention to what oh, was no. left. What was left on the stove? Did I forget to turn that off? I thought to myself, crapper. <laughs> I've often said that. So I ran back downstairs past the dripping ceiling that was now a stream oh, pouring onto my couch. I quickly removed the burning sugar from the stove and silenced the nemesis by plucking the 9-volt battery from the smoke detector. The smell of burnt lactose sugar lingered in the air along with a thick choking cloud of great disappointment. <laughs> I shut off the stove and prioritized what needed my attention first. I grabbed a screw, <laughs> <laughs> moved, my, moved my couch, and positioned a bucket. <laughs> I then put a hole in the ceiling to allow the waterfall of failure to flow quicker. <laughs> my wife was due home any minute, and I, couldn't, and I couldn't take that lecture on top of all this. I then quickly cleaned up the stove and sadly listened to the flow of beer turn to a trickle. Just then, my wife entered to the crime scene of alcohol abuse. She sniffed the air, eyed the dripping ceiling, and then proceeded to give me the stare of a thousand words. <laughs> I've seen that stare. It's not good. <laughs> the look on my face must have been horrible at this point because she just drew in a deep breath and said in a low, growling whisper, I'm going to bed. <laughs> That's it, I said to myself. Sometimes it's better to get yelled at. Oh, yeah. I cleaned up the mess and was able to save about 10 bottles of the beer. <laughs> oh, gosh. I guessed on the addition of milk sugar and mixed in what was left. I always keep carbonation drops on hand after listening to one of your podcasts. That was, that was very handy, Joe says. Um, the next day I had to face the music and tell the other three brewers of my mishap. I didn't sleep well, and my disappointment the next day hung heavy on my face as I explained what had happened. The first person... I told, suggested we try to rebrew, but time was against us because it's getting judged the first week in January. The second person says we should just go with what we have. This could happen to anyone. It's okay. The last person I told said, watch it be the winner, and they ask us for the recipe. I said without hesitation that I would update the recipe to include one loose bottling bucket, one wood floor, a ceiling, a couch, a fresh 9-volt battery, and a wife that could cut solid objects with one look. <laughs> <clears throat> the good news is, a few days later, my wife saw me still sulking and suggested I move my brew room next to the kitchen to prevent replacing and repair an repairing another ceiling and floor. I was excited about moving to a bigger room until reality hit. I hadn't replaced the ceiling or floor. <laughs> she wants me to strap on that tool belt and get busy. And that doesn't sound like the fun way of the... So Joe from uh, Chesterfield, uh, Joe Mann from Chesterfield, Virginia... That's right. And now now I have in my hand the final story. Final. There's none. Mm. There are no other stories than this one. The final story. Uh. All right. This looks like a this looks like a novel. <laughs> it is novel. It's just in a bigger font. Okay. Okay. He did double space. Okay. Now the or she. Now the first line, this comes from Mark. 
uh, up in uh, up around uh, uh, the Seattle area. Now, the the first line should give us a hint. Okay. The first line says, "I'm a colleague of Zot O'Connor up here in Washington." <laughs> That's it. I'm gone. I'm out of here. I I know where this is going, and it won't be pretty. No, Zot, Zot, is, Zot is associated with epic things. Yes. So. Okay. So uh, we had our Mount Sai Brewing Society Club meeting last night. You att- you attended one in 2012 yeah, when NHC was here. Remember? Yeah, yes, I do remember. I that do. was a, that was a fun day. We yeah. saw a bear that day. Do you remember that? Yes, I do. I suggested we go after the bear in the truck. No, we didn't go after didn't the bear. Zot mentioned that you were still collecting stories of homebrew disasters, and since, since Zot uh, constantly reminds me of mine this year, he suggested I pen something and get it to you. Okay, so here we go. So my disaster is actually plural meaning a series of incidents that are all connected via one subject, glass. Glass number one. (sighs) The first thing that happened to me was somewhat unrelated to brewing, but I feel it left bad juju in my garage, (laughs) and so I begin there. My wife chases me periodically to clean shower doors in our master bathroom. I usually toil away at the task in the shower, but this time I decided I needed to use man tools, and so I took the door downstairs to my garage in search of a little sander with a polishing bonnet. You took the door off? <laughs> took the door off. off. <laughs> Put the door back. back. <laughs> what knockers. <laughs> Thank you, Doctor. <laughs> it's one of those doors that has the wheels on the top and a towel rack in the middle. I was carrying it by the towel rack, and it opened the door to the garage. I pushed the door to swing open, and it has an automatic spring return. So in one swooping <laughs> motion, I step down the two stairs to the garage, but in doing so, every so every ever so lightly, tapping tapping the trailing corner of the door on the last step. Uh, I stopped suddenly, thinking, uh-oh, that wasn't good. At first, nothing happened, and I took one more step. Then I heard this very subtle tink sound, And all of a sudden, the entire door disintegrated into tiny safety glass sides beads and shot a six inch by eight foot perfect crystal line on the floor in front of me. I'm standing there holding the towel rack, unable to even summon the word that you may be thinking that was boiling up inside of me when the garage door opens and my wife says, well, that's one way to clean the door. (laughs) I like her. True epilogue, I actually went and got the second shower door and brought it out into the garage and cleaned it. I don't give up that easily. So learner. So he's saying, I know I'm right to do this, <laughs> even though it failed epically the first time. Okay. Glass number two. Okay. About a week later, I'm cleaning carboys in the garage and sanitizing them for a brew day on Sunday. As I'm in my mid-fifties, I'm always angling for some sort of gadget that takes the pain out of brewing. I call it this old brewer. (laughs) Lifting and transporting carboys and kegs gets harder every year. He needs a brew Brew hauler. hauler. Product placement. Okay. I had rescued an old potted plant bottom. (laughs) That was my nickname in high school. (laughs) I know. Or it's mine nowadays. Old (laughs) potted plant bottom. With roll around casters from the gar- garage or the garbage earlier that week, dumpster diving my own trash <laughs> <laughs> and feeling rather smug about my idea was using the plant tray to roll my carboys around the garage. Well, of course, as I'm rolling a six gallon carboy full of star sand over the expansion crack in the floor, <laughs> I don't want to go there either. <laughs> one of the wheels catches on a piece of stone. Oh. The carboy tips off the tray and hits the floor. Yeah. Instantaneously, there is a tidal wave of sanitizer spreading out in all directions. Again, the F-bomb when I realized that the spot of the foul was exactly where the shower door shattered. Ah. Hence the juju connection above. Yeah. Glass number three. Okay. That very Sunday, still in the garage, I had just finished chilling a 10-gallon batch of IPA and had racked it onto two carboys. Mm. My process at the time was to use an old doormat to lay the carboys on their sides with a solid bung in the end. (laughs) (laughs) (sighs) And to to roll them or shake them to aerate them prior to pitching. I had done the first of two and had just lifted the second carboy onto the mat. I started to put it down on its bottom edge, 
when the entire thing literally breaks in half. Oh, gosh. The lower half wobbles upright with about one and a half gallons still in the bottom, but the rest of the beer spreads out all around me and heads for the driveway. I'm in shock that this is now the third piece of glass that has failed me. Being the cheap SOB that I am, I have to admit that I took the one and a half gallons and worried about my... <laughs> <laughs> and, and worried about any stray glass shards, poured it through a tight mesh steel strainer into a 10-gallon glass carboy and actually rescued at least that much from the half batch. By the, way, by the way, I bought a 2-micron micron stone and an O2 tank and now do my aeration the right way. <laughs> Finally, glass number four. He says, the best one, really. Sunday evening... <laughs> <laughs> I finished cleaning up the brew day, <clears throat> put all of my equipment back up on the shelf on one wall of the garage. I pulled my Honda Accord back into the garage bay next to the shelf and went to bed. I got up Monday morning, got my gym bag together, and headed out into the car. I paused to put my gym bag in the trunk and then realized with horror that the entire rear window of my Accord was completely shattered. It's one of those moments when your brain races and says things like, Holy, the, something's not right here. Holy, some somebody's broken to my car. Wait, he's still in the garage. When I finally stopped long enough to actually look at what was going on, I saw what had happened. I When I put my 90-quart mashed-on cooler away the night before, I put it on top of another cooler, but apparently hadn't dried the bottom or it was not seated correctly. On the end of the mashed-on is a ball valve with a large brass nipple. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't want to go there. <laughs> well, the mash tun had fallen overnight, and the brass nipple had... That was the name of a club around here. The brass had, nipple? <laughs> yeah. It had landed right on the rear window of the car. As I gazed across the rear of the car, I saw the aforementioned mash tun lying between the car and the shelving. Seriously, all within about eight days. <laughs> God. Zot still brings up any issue with glass and me, basically, every club meeting. <laughs> I, I wouldn't see Zot doing that. No. I no. guess I deserve it. <laughs> so that's Mark up, up there with Zot in the, in the Seattle area. Well, so that's our stories. Holy smokes. There you go. It's a record. It's the longest show ever. Really? Wow. Yeah, I we, think so. You set a new record? Yeah. I think it's been fun. Have you had fun? I've had more fun than I can even describe. <laughs> And I've learned that jorts are shorts cut off from jeans, <laughs> <laughs> worn by hipsters and douchebags. <laughs> Is that but what it says? That's what it says in Urban Dictionary. <laughs> so oh. now I know something new. <laughs> well, I guess during the 70s, I was either a hipster or a, or a douchebag because well, I, you wore, were both. I wore plenty of jorts. Oh, that's what I'm saying. Cut off, cut off jean shorts, that's it? That's a jort. Oh, for crying out loud. Well, well. thanks again to our sponsor. I hope you've enjoyed the show, and I hope it wasn't too overly long, but hey, I wish I had a nickel for me. <laughs> you got nothing better to do, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and it's free. And worth every penny. That's right. Well, thank, thanks to everybody who supported us over the – thanks to everybody who sent in the, the, uh, 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 the stories, and Steve and I will have to go through the arduous task of picking out who gets a prize, and you'll get an email if you've gotten a prize. Heck, just being mentioned on the show is a prize enough, right? That's right. And thanks to the Brew Hauler folks for uh, for uh, supporting the the show, the disaster show again. If you don't have a Brew Hauler, if you got glass carboys, you need a, you need Brew Haulers. That's for sure. For every one of them. Shoot, I'd hold my bathtub with one of those. <laughs> just pick it up at both ends. <laughs> This is not an approved use of the Brew Hauler. <laughs> checks will not be cashed. This check, checks will not be honored. Okay. All well, right. And, and thanks to everybody who's stuck with us over the years. Uh, this is the end of 2014. This is the, actually the beginning of 2015 because this yeah. is the January 1st show, uh, which I didn't mention at the beginning of the thing. But uh, that's it. This is the this is the freeform version. And... Uh, it's been great. And thanks to you, Steve, for hanging out. Thank you, James. Another year. Cheers, everybody. Go to our website, basicbrewing.com, and uh, see all our stuff. Yep. And uh, click on our Amazon link on our webpage yep. and uh, and help support the show. Absolutely. And we hope that everybody has a, a fun and prosperous and healthy and disaster-free 2015. 
No, we need a few disasters. Yeah, well, yeah. Because we got to have. Yeah, we got to have another show next year. Yeah. <laughs> we just hope you don't get hurt. That's right. <laughs> Cheers, everybody. Cheers. Cheers.